So we're in this series called uh, He Shall Be Called, based on a verse in Isaiah. And Isaiah is one of those books in the Old Testament that if you're not uh, that familiar with, it can be very uh, surprising at times. It can be hard to read as there's much going on in the book, and it actually spans a very long period of time. So it can be confusing because things are going on in the first part and things are going on in the second part, and they don't seem to always make sense with each other. I know it's a book that in the scriptures that I've found great richness in, but also I've found it very difficult to read at times and to really understand. And this verse that we've been in uh, from Isaiah 9, 6 is one of those verses that I find very difficult to understand myself. So Isaiah 9, 6 says this, it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Personally, I've actually always found this a difficult passage. And the reason why I found it a difficult passage is uh, the section that we're going to talk about today, and that is Everlasting Father. When I was 19 years old, I left home to go to Bible college. This sense that I needed to understand God more, and so I chose to go to Tyndale in Toronto. And my whole desire was to go for a year and to learn more for a year and then come back to Montreal, where I was from. Uh, But God had different plans in my life, and so things ended up changing a bit. But when I was in my first year at Bible college, I took an Old Testament course. And my professor was incredibly intelligent. He had two PhDs. Uh, He he, he talked so fast, you just had to know he was intelligent to talk that fast because you couldn't understand him half the time. He would throw smart words out there all the time, and you'd be like, i got to look that up because I'm not sure what that means. But one day, as we were studying Isaiah, it was an Old Testament survey course, so we talked about a different book in the Bible, or the Old Testament, or section of the Old Testament at a time. We were talking about Isaiah, and I, after class, I went up to him, and I said, Doctor, I'm really confused about Isaiah 9-6. And he said, Rob, there's nothing to confuse you. And I said, well, I'm still confused. What does it mean if we use this as a verse to talk about Jesus? What does it mean that it says everlasting Father? Because Jesus is the Son. And so I asked him that question, and he didn't answer me. Or he said something pretty quick, and I didn't really catch it. And for years, I never really got an answer. And in fact, it wasn't until I started studying it myself to try and make sense of it. Because this verse, which is incredibly important, and it's something that we reflect on at Christmas, saying this is how God announced who Jesus would be, using this term, everlasting Father, can be really confusing. There are two things that make Christianity unique from other religions. First is the person of Jesus. That Jesus is God in the flesh who came to earth, that we celebrate his birth at Christmas and his death and resurrection at Easter. And that through him we are atoned for, we are made right with God through his sacrifice on the cross. That makes Christianity incredibly unique. 
No other religion has a basis of understanding of us being made right with God by something that God does for us without us having to earn it. It's unique to Christianity. It's unique because Jesus is God. The second thing that makes Christianity unique is the concept of the Trinity. Some of you might be familiar with this idea, some of you maybe not so much. But the idea of the Trinity is that God is three persons in one. And so there's a graphic that can be used to kind of explain what this is. And, it, and I have to be honest, I don't expect you to fully understand this. I don't fully understand this. But this is something that is taught throughout Scripture, though the word Trinity is not used. The principles of it are. And it's something that's been accepted since the beginning. So the idea is this, that God is three persons. The old father, church fathers would say God is one essence and three persons. So in the center you have God, and you would say that the Father is God, and the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. But the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. So there's distinctness in the personness of God, but they're all God. So they're of one essence, which we would call God, but three distinct persons who have distinct purposes as we read through Scripture. So if this is true, which I believe it is, if this is true, why would Isaiah be speaking for God to God's people to say that the Messiah is coming, who we know as Jesus, and he will be called Everlasting Father? Because Jesus is the Son. To me, this could be confusing, and really it, it should be a little confusing. Part of why it's confusing is because we read an English Bible. Unfortunately, a lot of, in my opinion, the confusion that we have around Scripture is that words mean different things in different languages, and when we translate them, it isn't always as clear as maybe it could be, and depending on what Bible you use, I like to use the NIV myself, some of you might use the New Living Translation, some of you might use a New Revised Standard Translation. Depending on what Bible you use, the English words might be slightly different. And if you use like a Spanish Bible or a French Bible, then the words are again different. And there isn't always a direct translation to what is being said. So when Isaiah speaks these words, or these words are written down for Isaiah, the reality of his world is that there is an Assyrian army who is oppressing the people of God. And he is speaking to the hope that even in the midst of their darkness, in the midst of their oppression, that which they kind of brought on themselves in some ways, even in the midst of that, of feeling abandoned by God, God has not forgotten them, and God will come again, and there is a promised Messiah, the Christ, who will rescue them, and he is to be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So when Isaiah is writing this to these people, his thoughts are not about this idea of the Trinity. His thoughts are to explain who this Messiah is going to be and how to recognize this Messiah. But it doesn't change the confusion around this everlasting father term. Well, as I said, the translation might not be the easiest to understand or maybe even the best. And the truth is that if it's translated better, it's not really everlasting father, but father of everlasting, or father of eternity, meaning the one who has existed for all time. A a most direct translation would be perpetuity in English, which is usually something we use in a financial term, but in a a sense of an ongoing, never-ending, never-beginning. And so this term, this title, is to speak of Jesus, that Jesus has never not existed. And I know that's a double negative, and some of you who like English are saying, you shouldn't do that, Rob, but I'm doing it so you remember. You can hate me later. Jesus has never not existed. So when we talk about Jesus, we talk about his birth at Christmas, right? So we have this lovely scene, you know, it's so peaceful, it's quiet, we sing Silent Night, Somehow the baby doesn't cry. We don't know how that happens because we've ever been around a baby. They cry way too much. But we have this image and this idea that this is when Jesus, 
is born. And yes, it's true. How exactly it all came about, we can have some debates around that, or what day it was, all those kind of things, but they don't really matter. Yes, the person of Jesus was born there. But the Christ, who Jesus is, pre-existed. He has always existed. In the Old Testament, if you ever read your Old Testament, if you're reading through it and sometimes you get to this place where it says, Angel of the Lord, and Lord is all capitals, that's something called a theophany, which is God in the flesh in the Old Testament. It's some exhibit of God in personhood, different than God the Father. And so most New Testament scholars would say in the Old Testament, that's the pre-existent Christ. That's before Jesus was born, Christ always existed, was always there since the beginning. And so the idea of everlasting Father is not so much about being God the Father, but actually being the God of eternity. And so the term Father isn't the same as we think of as God the Father. It's more about being the bearer of eternity, the one who creates eternity. Jesus always has been. He's never not existed. He always has been. The other thing that this passage is telling us is that because Jesus has always existed, that makes Jesus God. This is one of the early struggles that the church had to deal with. There are many people, and still today, would say that Jesus is not God. Jesus was a wise teacher. Jesus was, you know, this wonderful human being who did nice things. In the early church, they were dealing with different ideas from people who maybe didn't know Jesus, saying, well, Jesus couldn't be God, as well, God can't be a person, and God, so maybe God gave Jesus special powers for a little while, like a superhero movie. And while he was on earth, he had those special powers, and he had these God powers, but he wasn't God. The only thing that has ever existed for all of eternity is God. So if Jesus is the everlasting Father, or the Father of eternity, that makes him God. The early church had to wrestle with this to make sure they were correct in their understanding of the Old Testament and their own interaction with Jesus, and they concluded this to be true. Jesus is God. So when we talk about the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus is as much as the Father is God. The other thing that's important about this passage is that it is through Jesus that we know who the Father is. Jesus is how we know God the Father. Some of us, if you've had ever had an experience where you've doubted your own faith or maybe you've encountered people who maybe believe something different, sometimes we can get to the point where we'll say, well, you know what, when I read the Bible, God just seems mean. You know, I've read the Old Testament. Everybody's killing each other. He's telling them to do all these sacrifices. Like, that's so mean. But Jesus seems so nice. He's so pleasant. He's almost like a hippie. Like, he's like, wow, love, everybody. But Jesus and the Father are one. In fact, Jesus says this himself in John 10, 30. I and the Father are one. We know who God is because we know who Jesus is. What we see in the Old Testament is often misunderstood contextually and misappropriated to God because sometimes we read it thinking like this is prescriptive of what God says, but in reality it's descriptive of what God's people did, not just what God says. And so we misunderstand some of those significant, sometimes violent, sometimes confusing events, saying, well, God's saying to do all these things, but in reality, it's descriptive of what happened. So when we know Jesus, we know who God is like, and only through Jesus can we really know what God is like. In that same section of Scripture in John 10, verse 30, it says, but if I do them, so he's being challenged by some Pharisees. He says, like, if he does miracles, but if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works. That 
you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Jesus is arguing for himself to be God in that situation, the evidence of God in the world for those people around him and for us. The only way to really know God is to know Jesus. And I believe that the only way to really know yourself is to know God, which means getting to know Jesus. Jesus demonstrates through his love, through his compassion, through his anger at times, through his sadness, what it really means to be human, but also exemplifies for us who God is and how we can relate to him because of who he is. If we desire to know who God is, we need to know Jesus. It's that simple. N.T. Wright is a New Testament scholar, and he did a video some years back for this organization. And one of the things that I love is in this video, he's asked by the interviewer, and they say, you know, if you were dying and your grandchild, you had just had a grandchild at the time, if your grandchild came to your bed as you're dying, what are the last words that you want your grandchild to know? If you're familiar with N.T. Wright, he's, or not familiar, he's written an extensive amount of books, uh, he has, you know, got PhDs. He's really incredible to read. He talks a lot about the kingdom of God, and I've learned a lot from him in my own uh, devotion and my own life to understand God more. But what he said, uh, it's always stuck with me. He said this. He says, if you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what it means to be human, look at Jesus. If you want to know what love is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what grief is, Look at Jesus, and go on looking until you're not just a spectator, but you're actually part of the drama, which has him as a central character. To be human, to know God, is to encounter Jesus. And not just encounter and read about him and study him and go, oh, I know who Jesus is, but to be part of the story that God has been unfolding throughout history and inviting us to be part of. Christmas is, you know, we usually talk about just the baby Jesus. But as we sang in the second song today, what we adore is not just that Jesus was born, but he died and he suffered for us so that we can have the forgiveness of our sins and experience life in all of its fullness. It is only through Jesus and with Jesus, by submitting to him and following him, Can we really experience that? And so while we enjoy and celebrate the baby being born, we don't forget he didn't stay a baby. And so he is the father of eternity. He has always existed. And in his continuous existence, he is with us always. So if you want to know Jesus more, what do you do? Maybe it's a thought that's crossed your mind. Maybe it's something that you're not too concerned about at this stage, but let's say at some point in your life, in your journey, you're like, hey, well, who is this Jesus? If I want to really know who God is, if I really know who I am, how do I learn more about who Jesus is? And it's really, really simple. Read the Gospels. The first four books of the New Testament are the stories of Jesus. And they are the evidence we have of what he did, and who he was. I know for myself, when I read the New Testament, it's quick, easy for me to jump past those four books and go and go, what did everybody say about Jesus? And kind of forget what Jesus actually said. But spend time with Jesus in the Gospels. Read the stories. And there's a great practice that you can do that I like to do. You don't just read the stories in the sense that you read it like it's any other book, and go, well, that was nice, and close it. But you imagine yourself into the story. This works especially great with the stories of Jesus. When you read the story of him feeding 5,000, what was it like to be on that mountainside? What if you were there? Imagine. God's given us the gift of imagination. And by the work of the Holy Spirit, we can imagine ourselves into these stories And so that we don't just read and know who Jesus is, but encounter him through those words. What would it be like to be in that crowd to witness a miracle? 
What would it be like to be in the crowd where Jesus is rushing by and a woman who's been bleeding for forever stops him and he says, where did my power go? What would it be like feeling the pressure of that crowd crushing in on you too while you were trying to get a glimpse of him? What would it be like to be at the crucifixion, to see his closest friends are not there, and you're standing there watching him die? Imagine yourself. When we encounter Jesus through the written word and through the gift of the imagination, we can see and know who God truly is and in turn come to know ourselves. If we desire to experience the joy that we can have in our lives, we can only do so through Jesus. Take time this week. Read your Gospels. Read yourself into the Gospels as well. And imagine what it would be like to encounter Jesus like that audience did and see who God is in the flesh. Let's pray. God, I thank you that we have a privilege um, to be 2,000 years after Jesus' birth. We have a privilege to have history and story to be told and to be read, to know who you are, Jesus. That we have a privilege to be in this place and this time to hear others talk and know Jesus. I pray that for each of us, as we are in this celebration of Christmas and in the celebration of your birth, we don't forget that you've always existed. You are not just a child who was born on one day, but the Christ who has always existed, the one who's come to set us free, free of our fears and our sins, free to experience joy and life everlasting, and that only through you can we experience this. Jesus, I pray we know you. I pray we know you because you know us, and you know us better than we know ourselves sometimes. And in knowing us, we can find the freedom we so desperately sometimes desire in who we are. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that we open our hearts and our minds to encounter you, Jesus, to encounter you when we read scripture, but encounter you in our daily lives as we encounter each other who are made in your image, God, and come to know the truth that you are God, that you've forgiven us, Jesus, and you've given us an opportunity to experience life in all of its fullness. Let's pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.